Ayun ako may tingin. Thank 
Good morning all. So uh, I just waited a few minutes just to take everything, everyone in, and then uh, um, so today we have uh, like uh, uh, the day three lineup to follow. So first we will uh, do vulnerability scanning and some of the theories behind it. And then uh, uh, I have set up some Wireshark analysis for you because most of you already know what is Wireshark. I hope uh, almost everyone knows what is Wireshark. So uh, what we will be doing is we'll be using some of the examples to understand what you can do with Wireshark to do different traffic analysis. So it might be useful for when uh, there are some incidents that you need to uh, understand or when there are some incidents when, uh, where you need to look for answers. So it might be useful at some point. And then uh, I will just go through some of the best practices in email server admin, uh, especially from the DNS side. So, uh, uh, I'm not going to go into much details of this uh, email uh, DNS security because uh, uh, the next workshop will be on actually DNS and DNS set. So it will be something similar. So here we will be looking at something that you can do at the moment uh, from the DNS side. Uh, so that would be the today's lineup. So uh, my original plan was to first do a slide check and then go for the pen, uh, penetration testing <coughs> lab. But uh, then I thought first we'll, we should go for the uh, first part of the penetration test because uh, some of the packages that I want to uh, wants you to use might have some updated uh, updates and most of them have to be uh, newly installed. So it might take some time. So uh, shall we go through the installation first and then I will uh, carry on these slides while that installs. And uh, after that, we can again come back to the lab and then uh, do the penetration testing and whatever the other stuff that we have lined up. Um, okay, so uh, something I forgot. So, uh, so this workshop is funded by Asia Connect project uh, from European Union uh, and the Asia Connect partners and then the team CC will be doing the monitoring of the project. So actually, uh, team CC, they asked uh, to ask you a favor. Uh, so they wanted uh, everyone to switch on their uh, videos or so they all can see your faces in the recording. Uh, so it was a request from them uh, to ask whether you can switch on your micro, uh, videos when you are connected.
Okay, and then I disable the waiting room so it will be easy for everyone. Mm. All right, so uh, shall we go to the, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll share my screen. Mm. So this will be uh, the agenda page. And uh, if you go to this agenda page or if you're already uh, in the agenda page, please uh, refresh this. Then you will see some uh, links for the day three. Uh, go to this pen test link. So for this pen test, uh, you are supposed to uh, use a Kali Linux. So uh, why we use Kali Linux for this is it's easy for uh, setting up some of the packages that we might be using. And then um, uh, most of the dependencies will be there in Kali Linux uh, pre-installed. So what you have to do is either use the pre-existing uh, packages or to do a small installation on some of the packages that you need. So that's why most of the time Kali Linux is being used for different pen, uh, vulnerability and penetration testing. Uh, if you have not already downloaded that, please uh, use that given link uh, to download it. It might take some time because it's like 3.7 G or something. Uh, then uh, try to set up a VM uh, on whatever the hy hypervisor you are using. Uh, you will be needing, you will need the GUI, so please uh, use at least for GP RAM. Uh, it's a better if you can go even more than that if you have the capacity. So. Uh, once you set up the uh, VM with the uh, Kali Linux, so the, the image that I have given to you is a live image, so you can just uh, boot and work. Um, the default username password would be Kali Kali. So earlier, uh, sometimes back they used uh, the root user, but now it's uh, they are using a different user Kali. So it will be a non-root user. You can use Kali and the password Kali again. Uh, then uh, login, uh, login, once you log into the uh, VM, uh, go to the terminal. So it will be a Ubuntu based. So actually Kali Linux, it will be a Debian based uh, uh, OS. So go to the terminal and then enter sudo apt get update and it will update your package managers uh, once you update the packages you can uh, you can uh, run the installation command for something called openvas I will explain what is OpenVAS later, but uh, for now, just uh, uh, install this on uh, on your Kali. So it will take a few minutes for the installation, uh, depending on your internet speed and every other constraints. So uh, once you install OpenVAS, uh, you need to set it up. So the setting up OpenVAS is something like this, the GVM dash setup. So um, you need to enter this command as sudo unless you are in root. Uh, enter this as sudo and then this uh, initial setup will take around one hour. So, uh, so actually for me, it took around one hour 
uh, I am using a 100 m home connection, but still for me it took like 100 uh, one hour. So it's not because of the size of the data that it downloads, but it, it may be because of the latencies for the content. So uh, it will uh, install it will install some few other packages. It will update uh, repositories kind of stuff and then set up the uh, SQL databases inside and a lot of things. And then uh, at the end, it will give you a long password for the admin user. So this OpenVAS, it, it has a, a web-based interface. Sorry. <coughs> web-based interface. So this uh, web-based interface uh, will have a, eventually it should have a username password. So uh, for the admin user, they will give you a auto-created long string as a password. So long string means it's actually long, maybe around 20, 30 characters. So uh, once that setup finish, make sure you uh, not that password somewhere because otherwise if you close the terminal then uh, you can't log into the open so make sure you save that password somewhere uh, at least take a screenshot uh, okay so after after the installation we will uh, so up to installation we will just do it now and we will start the installation and then we will continue with the slides and after i finish the slides we can do the uh, rest of the lab so actually this will take at least one hour for the whole setting up and again if you are on a net uh, netted network and if you are in multiple devices again it might slow your uh, uh, slow your process because at a time these uh, these repositories they only allow one IP uh, to access with one multiple IP. If you have multiple connections, then it might not work. So it will it will take some time. So please uh, go ahead with uh, the installation, and if you have any question, you can ask. Uh, and there was a question uh, directly sent to me asking whether you can use a, a physical device as Kali. Yes, you can. If you have a physical device, please go ahead with the physical device. I'm not asking you to do the DM every time. So if you have a physical device where you can install Kali, yeah, just do that because it will be better. Uh, make sure you are, if you are using the VM, make sure you uh, bridge uh, bridge the connection to the physical interface, whatever you are having.
Okay, so uh, there are some questions regarding uh, uh, the installation. Uh, if you have any issues when updating, uh, Installing OpenRAS, make sure you have updated the apt get. So the first command should be apt get update. And then uh, yesterday I tried to install and it stopped in the middle. Yeah, so uh, if the installation stop rerun again, so it will uh, build from the scratch or maybe it will continue from whatever it, where it will start a stop. Uh, Niranjan is asking using Oracle VM. Okay. Uh, is it still not working? Yeah, it's, uh, it's not working. Uh, just send me the any disk, I'll check so any, everyone else can see what they are doing. Uh, so there were some questions asking. Uh, uh, I think Aninajan, you can continue with this. I just see it live. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so there were someone. Uh, uh, some of you asking uh, about the internet connections. Yes. So. Uh, yeah, if you are on data connection, mobile data connections, uh, it will be a big issue because yeah, it might cost you a lot. So try to connect to your office remotely and don't get it downloaded from there and set it up on a VM in, in your office. So, so what we do is that 
if you if you see my vm it's running in learn office so i'm not running it in my home because i'm i'm also in mobile connection so yeah better to use a steady connection for this By the way, we are providing 50 euros per day. So again, you can <laughs> cover that from as well. Yeah, so uh, the initial setup definitely will take like several minutes or maybe one hour or even more than that, depending on your internet connection. So once you do the, uh, once you start the setup, uh, the command GVM setup, uh, you can just rest and see what, how it goes. And then uh, in another few minutes time, I can start my presentation. So it's like 9.30 here and uh, 9.30 in Sri Lanka. So we will, uh, uh, we will uh, maybe, yeah, we can start uh, these slides in another 10 minutes time. So actually this was my installation. Uh, it will be like a lot of stuff downloading. So this thing will uh, take a lot of time. You can, you can see. And then uh, for this installation, this is this would be my password. So definitely, I can't remember keep this thing remembered. So you need to copy it to somewhere. And then they ask you to run another command. Uh, uh, this command. To make sure everything is correctly configured, it's better if, if you can run this as well. It will take another few minutes, but it's better to run this and see whether there are any other issues. So actually, I haven't run it, but you can run it and see. Uh, we'll do it in another tab. Mm 
Hmm. Yeah, there's some issue with me. Postgres since SQL does not exist. Anyway, once you uh, start the service, you can log into this particular website using your local host. Yeah, so you can just enter your issues in uh, in the chat, or if you want my direct help, you can uh, put any desk.
so install uh, installing or enabling Kali uh, SSH on Kali is a little bit difficult, so don't do that. You you can just browse uh, to the GUI from your uh, Kali G, uh, GUI because otherwise uh, doing SSH won't work directly, especially with this OpenOS installation because you need or you again need to connect to the uh, GUI to do the other practical. So uh, better not to do that. So always try to uh, use an uh, installation, uh, use the GUI of the Kali itself. Uh, so I'm running, we are running uh, Kali live version just for the testing. So if uh, in your production uh, cases, just install Kali somewhere and then do the installation uh, on the installed version because again, uh, running live might remove everything when if you uh, restart your server, so it won't you might need to reinstall everything. So using live version is just for the easiness for us, for the practical, but for your uh, actual thing or for the production environment, make sure you install Kali first and then uh, do the installations on the installed version.
Okay, so uh, while you do the installation, I'll continue with the, I'll actually start the presentation. Okay, so uh, this is just a few slides on uh, penetration testing and wonder what is vulnerability testing like this. But uh, so these slides contain a lot of content, and uh, I might try to uh, skip some of them because of the time constraints, but you can. Uh, see or you can read the slides later on if you need the additional details. So what is vulnerability testing? So vulnerability scanning or vulnerability testing means uh, you test uh, whatever your software or maybe your web page uh, or can it can be the operating system uh, for any issues in the system or for known uh, known issues. Uh, so. So there was a question asking, uh, there was an error in the installation. Uh, can you check the uh, general CTL, X, E, and see whether there are any uh, details on what was the error? Uh, so vulnerability testing can be done in different ways. You can do the network vulnerability scannings, web application scans, uh, or different other uh, internal or external testing. So the purpose of this is 
to check whether there are any holes in your security mechanisms that you use. So uh, even in the given uh, slide, you can see there is a fire, there is a wall, or so in this case, we call it the firewall. But there can be different holes where people can pass through your security. So finding them is the vulnerability testing. Mm. So uh, during a test, assets detected or manually configured. So assets can be created to be automatically detected or to or you can manually give them these are the assets that you have to scan or something like that. And then uh, better to run scans on different available ports, for example, HTTP or HTTPS or FTP, DNS, etc. And then uh, if you are running a big uh, infrastructure, better to do a vulnerability scan on operating systems as well. So there can be different uh, hosts in the network. So just do a scan in your network. And if there are like out outdated operating systems, then your scan will detect them. Uh, so the thing, uh, with outdated software, especially for example, let's say uh, let's say uh, operating systems like Windows XP, Windows Seven, or maybe even different other versions, or let if it's a uh, Mac OS, old Mac OS versions, or maybe if it's Linux version, maybe Ubuntu or CentOS or something, then the older versions of them can have multiple vulnerabilities, can have multiple known issues in this uh, operating system. That's why we ask you to go with the up-to-date operating systems in the in, uh, enterprise environment. Uh, so let's say if there is a particular uh, application that you need to run only on uh, Windows XP, then uh, you might uh, need to run, you might need to install a Windows XP, but this case Windows XP is like mentioned, but still some of the uh, hardware devices, for example, let's say uh, you have some sort of a, a monitoring device or some sort of a device that you do some kind of a research, but that needs to be run only on XP because it only supports XP then you need to uh, use XP, but if you if some of your users are using such uh, devices, try to remove them from the network because it can be connected to whatever the testing equipment, but if it is connected to the network and if it is connected to internet, it might be open to a lot of uh, issues. So if, if your users are using some of the older versions of operating systems uh, for different testing equipments, try to remove them from the network because I have seen a lot of even, so currently I am in a European country, but even in our universities, sometimes we see people use uh, older operating systems um, for example, maybe Windows XP, Windows 7, only because they don't have particular drives, drivers for the uh, newer versions of Windows, maybe for Windows 8 or Windows 10. So uh, because of that, they want to use uh, all the versions of the operating system for these applications or this uh, testing equipment. So what the university IT does is they they don't give they don't provide uh, the older versions of the operating system because uh, technically they are, they cannot do that because they are bound with Microsoft saying they are not going to provide any older versions of the operating system but uh, but somehow users they uh, get the older versions of the operating system and then they install it on their devices. But what the what IT asks is not to connect. Uh, what the IT department asks is not to connect these 
uh, older versions, older operating systems into your network. So that can be done from your side as well. So if your users have older versions, uh, try to remove that from the network. Uh, so for Windows, there can be different cracked versions. There can be different uh, uh, unlicensed versions, but yeah, still try to remove most as much as possible from your network. Otherwise, uh, it might be kind of a bot uh, host, or it can become vulnerable for different other uh, attacks. Okay, then uh, once you uh, identify something, you need to validate these vulnerabilities. So there can be different uh, false positives. So you need to validate them. Okay, so these are some of the uh, commercial products in the market. You can use some of these, but I'm not going to go into details of these commercial products. If you have money, you can, you can buy them and see. Uh, they are, in a way, it's easy for you to uh, use them because they will provide all the uh, support and all the installation guide. Uh, but if you don't have uh, the purchasing power or the budget, then you need to go with the open source products. So some of the examples are like, open mass and then there are a few other applications uh, most of them even are also in kali linux so uh, the issue with this open source product is there might not be a proper support for you because even some of these applications they have their own commercial product line so they will be uh, focusing on their commercial product line so they might not give you the community support, but from the community, you will get support. So uh, nevertheless, you can find some support from others in the community. So that's why we use open source, but it's, yeah, it's very difficult, uh, difficult to do the installation of these things if you are not that much uh, familiar with open source products. So uh, that was the vulnerability testing and what is a penetration testing? So these two are two things. Vulnerability testing is finding a loophole or whether there are any open uh, ways to get into your system. Penetration testing is uh, finding the weaknesses in your security. So there can be a firewall, but you can see whether you can penetrate through that, whether you can just uh, break the security and pass through that. So that is the penetration testing. So penetration testing needs to be done if you want to harden your security. So most of the time, uh, for example, let's say, uh, uh, let's say you use two-way authentication or multi-factor authentication for SSH. So that is a way of uh, hardening your system. So why you use multi-factor authentication is if you use only a single authentication method, maybe a password, uh, someone can try to log into your system maybe using uh, a brute force or something similar. So that is the way how you find it is by doing a penetration testing. So uh, the steps are like this: you start a potential, uh, you start with a list of known vulnerabilities, possible open ports, open old software, pa weak passwords. Uh, yeah, I have a spelling mistake here. And then uh, uh, once you find these vulnerabilities, then you list them uh, based on the criticality. And then you can 
do a device test on uh, other possible vulnerabilities like port scans, password crackers, software versions. Then uh, run possible wonder, uh, vulnerability tests again. And then if you find any issue, then you fix them. So that is what you need to do when even with the vulnerability testing as well as penetration testing. So some of the tools are like these. So there are a lot of Kali Linux tools. There are a lot of online sites. You can do penetration testing. Mm. Uh, we are not going to go into all, all of these things because of the time, but you can um, Google them. There will be a lot of tutorials. There will be a lot of uh, ways of uh, how you install this. So you can check them and see uh, how they can be associated into your system. <clears throat> okay, so when you are doing a network penetration testing, uh, there will be se several uh, categories of doing these kind of testing. So uh, one, one is called the back penetration testing, uh, but uh, black penetration testing doesn't mean it's kind of a black ha hacking. It's just you do the penetration testing without knowing anything on your system. So uh, in this case, you don't have any prior knowledge on your system. Then you can identify any gap encountered. Uh, so it can typically cover one, uh, one, two, three gaps or few gaps, but it, it can't go into full deep depth because uh, it's just, you are new to the system and you are doing a blind testing. Then uh, if you have any defenses in place, then you can see what are the response from your system. So it's like someone outside in your network doing a uh, scanning on your system. So the goal identify if an attack could be successful from the outside. So uh, there will be different pros and cons. So like simulate an attack, actual threat from the external user can be a pros, but the uh, other side does not cover all potential vulnerabilities and potential disturbance. So doing a doing just a uh, black penetration test might not be enough for you. So it's just checking whether outsiders can log into your system in a simple ways. Then uh, the gray penetration testing. So gray penetration means you have some level of knowledge on the network. So it's like the user level knowledge of the network. Uh, you can run different vulnerability scanning from the internal side as well as the external side. Uh, you can do different phishing campaigns to see whether your users are uh, aware of these kind of types. Again, you can test the defenses. Uh, you can check your incident response plan as well. So, now what we are going to do is we are identifying whether there can be a successful attack from outside. So in, in this case, again, uh, uh, since I talked about the phishing, uh, what you can do is you can, uh, you can formulate a phishing email, phishing sort of an email, and then you can send it to your users, hiding your identity don't send it from your name because then the users know who you are but try to send it from a different email address or some other or maybe using some hiding technique then you can see whether there are any responses into this phishing uh, email if there are any responses 
I mean the bad sort of responses. So let's say you ask someone's username and password and then someone gives you the username and password. Then that means you need to educate those users saying not to do that again. And again, if you get any uh, complaints from a particular user saying they received such requests from someone unknown, then you know these users are aware of what they are doing. So by that way, you can uh, test your users uh, and see how they are dealing with phishing attacks as so, well. Uh, later on, you can, after, after testing these things, you can later on put a group mail to everyone saying, we did something this, like this sometimes back and these were the responses and these, these are the good things and these are the bad things of our users or something like that, some summary. So based on that, you, your users will also educate uh, on what they need to do and what they don't need to do. So uh, think, some, think about some kind of plan for these sort of um, ways interacting with your users. Then uh, why penetration testing means it's the administration level of uh, testing. So you know all ins and outs of the network and now you do the uh, vulnerability scanning from internally and externally. So this should give you all the uh, weaknesses, at least most of the weaknesses, not 100%, but at least most of the weaknesses in your network. So. Now, the goal of a white test penetration is identifying vulnerabilities in the network. But white, test, uh, white pen, penetration testing will be somewhat hard and it will take a lot of time. And it might sometimes disrupt your live services as well. So when you're doing white penetration testing, you need to keep that in your mind. Okay, so uh, if you want to do a penetration test on website, what you can do. So if it's a black penetration testing on a website, uh, it's like uh, me doing a testing on one of your services. So I don't know what platform you run your application. I don't know what sort of CMS you are running but I'm trying to uh, figure out whether there are any vulnerabilities in your system. So that is one way of doing it. Then the same thing, uh, gray penetration testing. Uh, you, you, you can see whether there are user level accounts, whether there are self-registering accounts, uh, and once you log into your system, you can see whether there can be any ability to evaluate, uh, elevate the privileges of your uh, user roles. Uh, that means let's say there are some pages that some particular users can see, and then there are some pages some particular users can't see. You can log into few user types, user accounts, and see whether you can go uh, travel through those different websites whether they were properly or something like that. So that you can do the testing and then you can see whether, you can check whether there are any, if there are any defenses like IDS or IPS, whether they were properly or these things. And again, if you have any incidents response plan, whether it will work. Uh, so that is from the gray perspective of the testing. And then the white penetration, you can just review the uh, code. You can do code uh, automate, automate. There are different tools that can check the, uh, or review the code. So you can use them. You can uh, patch, or you can find any issues in the system. You can patch them. You can uh, patch the code if there are any issues. So. 
now you are looking at the administrator level of the system so you can do whatever the um, changes you need so in this case identify vulnerabilities to prioritize and remediate so that is what you need to do but this does not simulate any threat because you are now trying to find what you have okay so the difference between uh, the pen test and vulnerabilities pen test there is a specific goal uh, you are trying to penetrate some security and find what is inside but in vulnerability scanning or vulnerability testing what you do is you see whether there are anything open to others Okay, so next, the main thing uh, of uh, the vulnerability testing or penetration testing is you need to gather your team. You can't do it by your own. You need to uh, have a team because uh, if you are the only person in your institute doing all the IT stuff, then your team will be just you, but still you need to uh, keep your management know about what you are doing otherwise they will put you in trouble saying you can't do that and you can't do this so even you are the only person in your it or if if you are just doing it alone try to at least gather your management with you saying you need to do this if you are a person who are in a team where there are different programmers where, are, where there are different network people, where there are different software people, try to gather, gather them all before doing a such test because everyone should know what you are doing. Otherwise, someone can say, uh, I was doing something while you do the testing and then because of that, they couldn't do that, whatever they were planning to do. So you can, you can get an idea on based on your situation what i am saying so try to gather gather your uh, team before doing a similar testing and then uh, you need to get the permission make sure you get it in written because uh, once you do a penetration testing uh, sometimes it might uh, interrupt your services so if it happens, then if your website is a heavily used website or if your software is a heavily used software and because of the penetration testing, if that went down, then it will be a problem for you. So make sure you get it authorized by uh, in written and then uh, your top people, your top management, they know what you are doing. <clears throat> And uh, there are some examples on kind of authorization forms. So one, one is given. Again, there are different other examples in the internet. You can use one of them if you want, or otherwise you can simply write, write an email or write a letter to your management saying these things will be done on that particular day. Please give the uh, go for the permission to carry on the testing. Okay, so what happened if you don't get that? It will it can become an insider threat. So if you don't get the permission, someone can accuse you saying you are an insider attacker. So make sure to get the permission before doing that. So it depends on the environment. It depends on the uh, it depends on your management. So nevertheless, it's better if you can get the permission as required. Then uh, you can have a scope, you can have a particular goal before doing the test, what you need to do and what you should do and what you are going to test. 
so for example uh, key personal login credentials with successful login uh, laying hands on the content of a key sensitive database root access financial system accesses data backups whether there are sensitive data on these uh, data backups are they in plain text if if there are sensitive data then you can suggest they should be uh, encrypted or something similar so these things can be uh, decided before doing the testing then you need to come up with the schedule uh, what to do so in this case i am going in weeks but it can be either days so or it can be either months uh, it still depends on how many systems you have and how many uh, how much intensity you are going to put into the testing so in in this example in weeks for the first week you can do the uh, uh, checking so approximately one week one week worth of time spent across month before the test will the scope um, you can write the plan you can get the permission you can set up all the tools so don't uh, don't install open was today and do the testing in the evening so you install open was in the morning and then you do the testing in the evening it's not going to work uh, because even the installation even today we can't say this open was installation might work correctly because we were just installing it in the open uh, or the live versions there can be uh, kali dependencies there can be postgres dependencies like what you saw in my installation so uh, before starting the <coughs> testing you need to set up your tools and see whether they actually work then on the uh, pen test week or the week two uh, you take up uh, go into a room and then you hide for the week you are doing actively the testing so uh, you have to do it in the given in whatever the plan period so it depends on whether you are going to do it in the peak cover or whether you are going to do it in the off peak cover whether you are going to do it in the both time so sometimes there can be tests where you test your uh, web server's ability to handle a lot of uh, requests so we have seen some of the websites, for example, let's say there's a website you open for students to apply for a particular degree program. That particular website might get a lot of uh, requests on a particular day, maybe on the first few days of the opening the uh, pro program. So during such period, whether you can handle a lot of requests, if it was a uh, website that allows users to see their results, at some point, if a particular uh, exam releases their results, then there will be a huge traffic into your website. Whether you can, you, so you need to test whether you can uh, accommodate them. So it can be a load test, but still, you can check whether during a such load whether someone can uh, log into your system because some of the firewalls some of the uh, security devices you uh, you use might uh, not check all the traffic if it is on load so there are some kind of firewall configurations where they say if the firewall is in its maximum load it will not test the rest of the traffic it will just allow anything check whether they are like that if that is like that then you have to block block it 
so your firewall shouldn't allow if unless it's not it's tested so uh, things like that need to be uh, planned and done then on the week three you will forget what you learned if you don't immediately write it down so uh, in the sense you don't have to write it down but you need to at least save the logs of what you did uh, then document the whole thing what you did what you learned and what you should do to cover these things cover if there are any issues so that is the testing documentation so the results and everything have to be done and then you can simply give the report to your administration or to the management if they need again you can uh, present whatever the findings and say these are the things that we should do to save the uh, whatever the system you are using okay so the rules behind uh, once you finish the test choose the most critical findings the most critical things the easiest non-tribal to fix and then most visible things most critical and most visible will be two things so it can be a, the most critical thing can be a software patch or maybe some uh, issue in the logging system or something like that and then most visible thing can be a different thing maybe uh, maybe plain text password uh, a login page on plain text or http not on https something like that so those things will have different uh, levels so try to find the most uh, top rated things and then touch them Okay, so Kali, again, uh, I'm not going to go into details of the Kali. So Kali can be used for different purposes. Uh, you can read this. Then there are different tools. I am listing a few of the tools. And uh, you can see different tools and some examples like ping. You can do different types of pinging from Kali. Uh, trace routes nmap is a useful software to see what are the open ports and then uh, uh, different things like uh, remote login who am i tcp dump uh, we will talk about tcp dump in the next session as well uh, yeah there are different other applications as well so there are a lot of slides containing the descriptions you can just go through the slides later on uh, okay so then there's a send map uh, you can run send map on your uh, uh, kali and then uh, shorten uh, shorten is a website so this is not coming something that comes with Kali but uh, you can just go to this website and then uh, you will see all the online devices in the internet on this database so you can see what are the uh, open devices in your uh, in your network you can just type your university name or institute name and see what people will see once you do a search on that particular uh, uh, name or the search string uh, there can be different cctv there can be different uh, cameras uh, yeah username passwords uh, uh, the username admin and password from the previous step i think it's the password yeah so uh, uh yeah someone is asking about the default password so the default password for the security assistant is on the installation script. 
uh, at the end you will see a long string that is the uh, password okay so i just quickly went through a lot of stuff uh, and again you can do a few vulnerability testing with firefox as well so there are different apps you can use uh, simply uh, you can try these uh, applications as well so uh, i will uh, drop out for the lunch so we can uh, go for lunch and then come back in 30 minutes and then we will quickly go with the uh, rest of the pen penetration testing tutorial i will just quickly explain that what to do uh, there's nothing much uh, and it's very easy so it's just uh, following these steps uh, then uh, after that, we will do some Wireshark and uh, let's see what we can do on uh, emails as well. Okay. Okay. So see you in half an hour.
Okay, shall we start? Okay, so uh, again, just a reminder for everyone. Uh, so at NCT, they wanted us to keep your video screen switched on. So yeah. Okay, so uh, what is the, um, are there any updates on your installation? Yeah, so I got a few messages saying it's still installing for most of you. Hmm. Okay, so uh, uh okay, so I'll I'll just explain again uh, these steps. So if there's anyone who didn't log in in the morning, so they can just follow up. Mm, okay. So for this, we need to do a Kali Linux installation. So in this in this lab, we are using the live image, but in the production environment, try to do uh, try to do it on your. Uh, actually installed Kali Linux version. So you should install it in a bare metal, don't go with virtual machines. Uh, get a 80 GB RAM, uh, maybe i5 or i7 PC, then uh, install uh, Kali Linux on that. After that, you can do whatever the stuff you want to do with Kali and then uh, you can decide where you put your in, uh, put your device. So, in the sense where you put it in your whether you put it in your internal network or whether you put it in your external network. So, uh, in my case, I'm using it as an external device. Uh, so, my Kali uh, installation or this live version is running on a public IP. 
so you can keep it inside the net or again you can keep it outside if we are running let's say if you are, if you want to do the black uh, black penetration testing kind of a thing then you need you need to keep it on the outside network so that that is like you put it with a public ip and then try to log in uh, if you are doing the administrative or the white uh, type of penetration then you can do the uh, internal network connection with the internal networks so it depends on how you do the uh, uh, do the uh, testing so actually i <laughs> got a message from uh, someone saying her virtual box got crashed yeah so we will be using a lot of ram so it might have some <laughs> tendency to crash uh, and since we don't do the installation of Kali Linux, since we are using the live version, if your uh, Kali uh, got crashed, then you have to do it from the beginning. So it will take a little time. Uh, okay, so this is just for the testing purposes, for the lab purposes. So that's why I asked you not to do the live installation for the uh, uh, actual thing or for the uh, production thing. Uh, once you log into Kali, you need to make sure you update the repositories, uh, update your apt get, and then install OpenVAS. Uh, once you install OpenVAS, you need to uh, do the initial setup. So the initial setup should be run by GVM setup. Uh, so this OpenVAS is kind of a uh, vulnerability test uh, that was bought from a different company sometimes back and now they have changed the commands to GW, GVM. Early it was OpenVAS setup. So if you check the internet, you will find some tutorials saying OpenVAS setup, but I'm not sure whether it works at the moment. So just check whether both commands work, but the newer version is GVM setup or the GVM commands. Uh, so this Greenborn uh, security assistant is what we are installing with this OpenVAS. And uh, the setup will download a lot of things into your system, a lot of uh, signature-based uh, stuff. And it will take uh, like one hour or more, even more than that, depending on your network connectivity. And it will not download large files, it will download small, maybe few megabytes files, but in a large quantity. That's why you are, that's why we are getting a lot of time for this installation. Uh, once you do the setup, it will, it will give you the uh, uh, admin username and the password. Make sure you save it somewhere because it's, it's uh, auto generated one. And then, uh, it will ask you to do a custom, uh, it will ask you to do a system check before running the uh, whole thing. Uh, it's better if you can if you can run that and see whether everything is there, but for the lab, I'm not going to do it because it, again, it will take some time. Uh, and since I'm not doing it, I'm not sure whether I will succeed in doing the test as well because it will run the uh, GUI, but it might not run the actual test as it should be so for your production uh, installation make sure you do the installation as per their uh, uh, guidelines and if you get into some trouble just search most of the time they will give you the uh, fixes what you need to do uh, but in case if you can't find any fixes for that then uh, please search the specific error on their uh, community forum. They have a community forum, so they will provide you all the uh, uh, things, all the help you need. So uh, that is one thing you need to know when you are dealing with open source software. So there, there are a lot of tutorials in the internet, especially uh, OpenVAS plus Kali Linux. 
So you can try them as well. Again, you can install OpenWAS in a simple Ubuntu server as well, Ubuntu device as well, but it depends on you whether whether you want to run just OpenWAS or whether you want to associate different other tools that Kali comes with. So why we use Kali is we just want to use the, sorry, we want to use the Kali uh, installed, pre-installed applications. Once you do the installation, uh, there will be a few ports running the service, port 80 and a few other ports. Uh, just to make sure you can run a netstat and see whether these ports are listening. Uh, and if not, uh, you can simply run sudo gvm start. I'm using sudo because we are now Kali is not Kali is running on a non sudo version, non sudo uh, uh, user, user Kali. But if you are on root, you can simply use gvm start. Uh, why we are using netstat is uh, this uh, OpenWAS might have multiple uh, process, processes. So uh, because of that, you can't just simply check whether one or two uh, services are running. So the easiest way is to check on netstat and see whether these ports are open. If these ports are open, then that means you can uh, simply uh, uh, use the service and then uh, you can go to the website uh, your local host 9392 which is on https so when you log into your uh, this thing from okay so for this you need to use the kali inbuilt uh, browser don't use your host machine or any other device because this won't be open to the uh, external connectivity. It will be just uh, localhost connection. Uh, go to that and then uh, log in. Once you log in, uh, you will see some uh, similar uh, image like this. Uh, I, I'll show you my installation since most of you are not running your own installation. Mm. Okay, so this is uh, this is my Kali installation. And again, I'm remotely connecting to this desktop because the actual VM is hosted somewhere uh, in LAN and I'm a thousand kilometers away from that of, uh, VM. Okay, so uh, this is the login page of that, of the, uh, of this thing. And uh, here I have a lot of latency. <laughs> Username is admin and the password I copied. Thank you. 
if you logged into your uh, Greenborn Security Assistant, go to uh, Scans. So there's a, there should be a menu called Scans, and then go to uh, New Task. Uh, in this location, there's a drop down menu. Go to New Task, and then there will be a wizard icon, the one I showed in uh, purple color, but in, in your case, it won't be purple. Uh, it might have a different color. Uh, click that, and then it will guide you through the wizard. You just have to enter your IP address of whatever the system that you need to test, and then click. Oh, OK, I'm getting an error. Seems like some Postgres issue. Oh. I thought I did it.
Okay, so even me, I'm getting this uh, Postgres issue. Okay, so uh, since it's not working as expected, uh, I'll just first show you the other example. Mm, so the other thing uh, was this uh, uh, DDoS pen test. Uh, so some kind of uh, interesting thing. So there's a, there's a software called HPing3. Uh, you can use this HPIN3 to do the uh, installation of uh, 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 do the testing of your system. So uh, you can use a similar command like this, uh, HPIN3 minus F minus flood, and then uh, the port number, and then uh, the uh, victims IP address. So in this case, uh, don't use the nearby IP of uh, IP address of your network just for the testing. If you are in a big network at the moment, if you use if you do that in your uh, network, sometimes your whole network might get flooded. So uh, try to if you are in on the VM, try to uh, test the internal uh, IP of the VM network. Then uh, uh, in the similar way, you can do different uh, type of floods, the UDP flood, syncing floods, mm, different other flags. So, uh, once you do this, you can see how your uh, service, how your website might work based on the uh, traffic that is that it receiving. So, uh, if you are if you want to stop receiving some uh, some DOS attacks from these kind of uh, attackers, actual attackers, then uh, uh, there's a service called fail to ban. You can install fail to ban. Uh, I haven't done uh, the guidelines for this for the workshop, uh, but you can simply search uh, the internet and find fail to ban, how to install fail to ban on whatever the operating system you want. Uh, I can just search. So fail to ban is uh, the way, it is one of the easiest way to uh, block uh, something that comes as a DDoS or a DOS attack. So uh, there are fail to ban in built in some of the applications for things like uh, TFNs, they already have that, but if you want to install it from the scratch on your system, maybe on a Apache server, you can do it uh, from uh, the guidelines. Here you can have a, some example. So these are some of the ways you can uh, associate fail to ban. And then uh, you can create fail to ban configuration. So here you can see ignore IP, this range you are ignoring, ban time, how many uh, seconds you are going to ban a particular IP if there's an issue, uh, maximum tries, and then uh, uh, different other things you can check the fail to bank site and see what are the uh, 
commands so again uh, fail to ban related ip tables then uh, changing the ban time find time those things uh, yeah this plus uh, i can share the share this link Okay, so uh, uh, twelve. Can you uh, share your screen so others can see whether you can log into the system, and you can you can enter my test machine's ID and do a scan. Uh, recent auto generated password can be uh, okay. So, if, if you uh, I'll, I'll share a command on the chat. Uh, so, if, if you have uh, a recently created password and then you, you can't find. Uh, If you can't if you can't find the password, then try to include these two commands, and then it should give you the uh, these two commands should give you the uh, password. So one thing is the uh, GVMD use admin new password by password history C and then again use history C to see the uh, password if you want.
Okay, so uh, yeah, I don't want to waste time on uh, figuring out what has happened with my installation. Uh, bottom line, install Kali and then uh, install uh, OpenOS, it will be easy. Uh, it can be some, uh, there will be a lot of dependencies even with the live version. So try to install Kali and then uh, do the uh, do the open OS installation. Or you, again, you can use the pre-installed Kali VM from the Kali website. They have some VMs, uh, but yeah, it depends on your configuration. You can download the uh, bare metal version and then install it in your server, in your PC or in a server. Mm, okay, so since we are running out of time, I'll uh, I'll quickly go to the other. Mm, Okay, so uh, I'll go to the next lab actually. So uh, if you are, Ah, I did. Okay, so I did something without uh, without sharing my screen. <laughs> okay, so uh, so I just enter uh, entered the hping command for a particular IP address, and then uh, you can see there was an error when I just copy paste because it is asking for the uh, privilege mode, so I just have to in include sudo since I'm not in the root account. And then uh, in here, you can see now this uh, attack is happening or the hping is happening. And if you have a network monitoring tool, you can see the traffic that comes into this port. So if, if, if this particular device is in a different port which can be monitored separately, then you will see a lot of traffic on this port as well. So uh, I'm just going to kill it. Uh, and I might try to log into that server and see whether I can show you something. Mm.
so this is the that particular i'm not sure this is installed yet So this is the traffic and then uh, if I start this thing again. You can see uh, there are a lot of traffic coming in the number increases. Uh, so that is what happens in the uh, uh, server side so if i just uh, let's see whether yeah so ufw is open at the moment if i disable this UFW, stop uh, disable Uh, so the tool I'm using is Nmon. You can use Nmon on uh, any 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 Linux version. So for Ubuntu, it's just apt install Nmon. Uh, so now you can see the traffic coming for the server after stopping the uh, firewall. And uh, if I do a EDP flood, So you can see how this increases the incoming packets, the receiving number of packets. Okay, so that is kind of an example for uh, Nmon. So now Okay, so now you can see there's no much traffic. So it's like eight less than 10. But when we were using this, it's like several thousands. So in this case, it's almost 4,000 4, 4, kilobytes per second. Okay, so uh, that is something you can try. Next, uh, yeah. then uh, 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 let's see whether this thing works again. Yeah, something went wrong with my post testing. Okay, let's go for the Wireshark. Uh, it, 
if if there's someone who who can show you a screen uh, you can find the uh, uh, you can try your uh, open mass against this ip so this is the this is the uh, that particular testing server i used just put a open mass on this ip and see what you can see it's just an html website with high one and high two like what we used like uh, last tuesday you can simply uh, try this and uh, see what are the outputs and if there are severe cases if there are critical cases just let me know because i need to remove that <laughs> because i will be keeping this for the whole week by the way, don't uh, put any edge pings into this because uh, it will flood your ISP networks as well. Okay, I'll uh, I'll go to the Fireshark tutorial. Uh... Yeah, I forgot to share it again. So the Wireshark tutorial, uh, you can use the Wireshark which is already installed in your uh, Kali. So in Kali Linux, Wireshark comes pre-installed. If you want to do it in your host machine, still you can do it by downloading Wireshark from their website and then uh, uh, installing it on your operating system. So uh, it will be easy, but here again, we are doing uh, some examples on TCP dump as well. So uh, uh, it's better to do with uh, test these things with Kali Linux because these commands are already there. Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay, so uh, before going into this, I forgot something to share earlier. Please uh, go to that URL uh, which I shared in the chat box, put your name and just to mark the attendance because we need it for your reimbursements of this 50 euro thing, especially. So please put that, in, put your name there. And if someone have forgot to put it uh, for the second day, just again, put, uh, put your name on the second day. Uh, the other thing, uh, if I forget to remind, uh, give you this link next day, just keep the link uh, saved because next two days also we will be using the same link. So, okay, uh, I hope you got it. All right, so uh, TCP dump is just to just a tool to uh, see what comes and goes out on your uh, network. So you can uh, do a dumping of whatever the packets or whatever the uh, things that comes in and out from your device. Uh, I'll yes, this thing. Then, uh, if I go to if I go to my website again, uh, uh, this uh, server. If I enter TCP dump minus v, I can see. Okay, it's not minus v. I think it's capital V.
No, okay. It's version. So this is the version that came with Ubuntu, but if this is not working in your, if the command uh, TCP dump is not working in your installation, just uh, apt get install TCP dump if it's Ubuntu. Uh, if it's any other Linux version, you can check their package managers for TCP dump because TCP, TCP dump is one of the common packages you should get with the operating system. Uh, if you just enter TCP dump, you will see a lot of stuff like this. So I'm killing the process. So this is the plain text uh, TCP dump result. Uh, yeah, I, I hope you can see the whole screen. Uh, so here you can see uh, TCP dump using uh, listening on this particular interface and uh, so I'm doing an SSH so this is the SSH traffic you can see the SSH and then there's uh, this traffic, so this is domain DNS traffic. Uh, you can even see the uh, DNS request. So this is the PTR record. It's requesting the PTR for this particular IP. Uh, then SSH data. So here again, there are some PTR DNS stuff. Then there's, there's a broadcast message, uh, either, either a message from somewhere. And then uh, yeah, other things, then some ICMP. Okay, so this is, uh, so this, this particular VM runs on a host. So uh, I have, in the, in the v, uh, VMware or virtual box uh, installation, there's something called promiscuous mode. So I have enabled that when installing the installing this VM. So because of that, in this interface, I can see every other traffic that comes to the uh, VM network. So here you can see someone trying to ping uh, some IP in the same network. Then there are a few app requests. So this is TCP dump. So this is just a unsorted list of uh, activities that is happening, happened at that time of running this command. And then uh, since I uh, uh, killed the process by control C, you can see at, at that time it received, by that time it received 54 packets and uh, these are the other uh, details where it had the filter and then drop by kernel this much. Drop by kernel means those packets are for different other devices. So all, 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 all together received 800 something and then dropped 700 something and the rest are for the uh, system. So that is just the uh, TCP dump, and then you can simply use the TCP dump minus NN. Then you will see the uh, time and so once you put TCP dump minus NN, you will see the time and uh, the date. So here you can see. And then you can see nice uh, lines like from where to where likewise. And then the details of the packet. This is, this is more clear than what we saw yet, uh, earlier. So actually this is mostly the SSH traffic from 22 port to whatever the port that I'm using for SSH. 
yeah there are a lot of ssh traffic and then uh, if you want to see particular uh, traffic let's say if you want to filter different attributes you can use these kind of uh, examples so in in this first first one you can see i'm only let's say your server have multiple interfaces so in in the, in the first line i'm saying you need to listen on this particular interface and then uh, whatever the traffic that relates to this particular ip and then uh, the second one again eth0 but now i am mentioning it should be destination uh, dst host should be this so the first one, first line it will show you all the traffic which mentions 10 10 10 10 10 uh, but for the second one it will only take uh, traffic that has 10 10 10 10 as the destination and now we are again restricting we only need tcp not everything then uh, the third one now i'm saying a source network earlier it was the uh, destination host but now a source network of that and then tcp and then i'm again defining a port range so i'm further filtering and then uh, what is this So this is, uh, you can see the uh, explanation. So there are some time packets that comes with zero uh, length. So they don't have a traffic length, but there are traffic like maybe ICMP or something like that. So, those things can be easily filtered with this. And here you can see the port 22, whether someone is trying to attack, whether someone is trying to uh, fingerprint. Then uh, this is again destination and source host filtering both. So here you can see a not a negation as well. And then uh, you can uh, save packets by using uh, minus W. So if you want to capture some sort of a packet, uh, you can simply do the packet uh, capturing by minus W and minus R to read. If you have a PCAP file uh, saved in your device, you can read it by minus R. So this is something uh, that you can try if you are new to TCP dump, because sometimes you might not be able to use Wireshark everywhere. Uh, everywhere means uh, if you, let's say if you want to uh, capture some packets on a particular server, which only runs um, the CLI, which doesn't have a, UI, GUI, then you can simply use TCP dump and do a packet capture, write it to somewhere, write it to some location, and then maybe you can export it to a desktop version and then do, uh, do the further analysis using Vyasha. So that is, uh, that is one way of doing it. If you are not that much familiar with uh, further filtering using TCP dump. So sometimes we ask people to uh, do TCP dump just to see what, uh, whether there are any connectivity issues among some sort of application. Maybe if you are using different VPNs, if you are using different uh, applications, uh, even for routing purposes, sometimes you use TCP dump. So that is regarding the TCP dump, any questions?
okay then uh, you may already have used wireshark you may have already done different things with wireshark so this is something again uh, that we want to highlight why wireshark uh, so someone can ask why wireshark so actually we need to have some sort of a packet analyzing software like tcp dump or wireshark to analyze some uh, events which might occur during the day-to-day -day, uh, security incidents so uh, if we can't find things if we if if we can't find what is happening, if we don't, if our IDS or if our firewall system doesn't identify these things, you need to do it manually. So doing it manually, uh, you need to have an idea on what is going on in your network, what is happening in your network. So to see that you need some sort of a software to uh, run the packet capture. So. In Wireshark, you can do the live packet capturing as well as reading uh, the saved packet captures and doing the analysis later. So in this case, uh, you can simply start a packet capture on your given interface and then uh, save it and then later on filter it based on different filters. So in this case, I have given few filters. These are not the all filters that you can use there are a lot of filters you can use use the wireshark documentation as well as different examples from the internet so in the in in, in this tutorial we are just showing you a few of them just to uh, filter a particular ip address a particular service or maybe a particular port number but there are a lot of other things that you can do with wireshark you can uh, Let's say if you do a continuous packet capture for some time, you might even see uh, plain text passwords on the packet capture as well. So, uh, for example, uh, few years back, yeah, not few years actually, 10, 15 years back, we did packet captures uh, on network, and we even could see some. Uh, chat histories with different clients. So uh, if you may remember things like uh, Yahoo Messenger or MSN Messenger, uh, earlier days they didn't use end-to-end -end encryption. So because of that, people in the middle were able to read all these messages. Even Facebook didn't have end-to-end -end encryption in the beginning. I'm, I'm, uh, this is, this is uh, something happened 10, 15 years back, but today, most of the time they have the encryption. So you can't see the content of actual communication, but still you can find whether this is a uh, messaging content or something else. So earlier days we used to capture packets and uh, we were able to read some content in plain text. Even we we were able to download images. There were some software that uh, did the mining for images as well. So, for example, if you did the packet capture and then if you read that packet capture through a mining software, then it will give you all the images that were saved from that packet capture. So it's it was like just tapping into a net uh, telephone conversation and reading the whole thing. Uh, so the same thing can be done with uh, today networks, but most of the time today networks, they have the encryption for the communication. But why we are doing this here is just to analyze, not to hack into someone, but to analyze what is happening in your network. So if someone is trying to do a bot attack, if someone is trying to do a uh, let's say if someone is doing an irc channel communication or maybe uh, trying to uh, do some sort of uh, let's say uh, 
brute force attack or maybe some other attack, you can identify them using these sort of analysis. Uh, analysis means you can just look at the number of packets, you look at the uh, forms of traffic and then identify what is happening. So uh, with Wireshark, it's easy to do this. You have colors, you have different uh, windows, even you can uh, dump the HTTP content and see what is happening. Uh, there are a few PCAPs, few PCAP files given in the uh, tutorial. You can download them and open them with Fireshark and try to find these, uh, find answers to these questions. Uh, so from the first PCAP, the telnet.pcap, you will see a username and password in plain text you will uh, after that you can see what they did so try to figure out what has happened so a uh, hint is given what to do you can just do this and see what has happened then uh, there's a massive sync attack uh, captured on the second pcap you can open the file and see what is how this can be an attack then a simple chat ftp data transfer so there are a few other things you can see this try to do this and uh, we'll we'll uh, put like 10, 20 minutes for this and you can finish by sharp. If you have any questions, you can ask while doing this. So this is the Wireshark website. If you are new to Wireshark, I haven't installed Wireshark in this machine. And, uh, okay, so this is the reason I didn't install Wireshark in this machine earlier. It, did, it doesn't have, uh, it's actually the machine I'm using is having this Apple M1 chip. Because of that, uh, I, I'm not going to install the Intel versions. I'll go with the Kali. Mm -hmm. Kali, Kali. Yes, Kali.
Okay, so apparently my colleague got stuck. Yeah, my colleague. Okay, so uh, this is the hard installation. I'm going to increase the uh, resolution, otherwise, it's too small. Okay, then uh, where shock? Okay, so the this thing uh, something about. Wireshark is you can use different uh, statistical models from this uh, Wireshark interface to identify what has happened in your uh, network. For so, for example, if you do conversations, you can see who contacted what and with what site or what type of. Uh, uh, magnitude so for example uh, these two had these kind of traffic transferred during two seconds so this is the actual ethernet part 
if you look at the IPv4 part, this will be the IPv4 part. Again, uh, the bytes. So actually, this is I'm SSHing into the particular server. And then if you see IPv6, it will be the same. So uh, this particular Kali uh, device, it have IPv6 connectivity. So you will see IPv6 uh, traffic as well. And then TCP and UDP, whether there are UDP sessions and whether there are TCP sessions. So these are some TCP sessions. And I'm, I'm not aware of this IP, so I can just check whether what this IP is. So it is connecting to 443, maybe some uh, background service. So that can be checked. So this is some simple idea on your network. So if you, so this is just a packet capture for just a few seconds in the local host. But if you, if you do a packet capture for a mirrored, uh, pack, a mirrored port, you can get the whole idea of your network. Who was using your network at that time and who used what and how much. So those ideas can be taken from these conversations. And then, uh, then there was another thing called endpoints. You can get all the endpoints of your device, the ethernet endpoints, number of bytes, IPv4, V6, TCP endpoints, basically the port numbers. For example, let's say there's a huge, huge traffic for a particular web, a particular server, and if you want to identify what what is happening, you can do a TCP dump and see uh, the num number of uh, packets that that is received for each port number. So the easiest way is to get TCP dump from the uh, server and then analyze it using uh, uh, things like Wireshark. So. We have seen a lot of uh, web servers, especially servers that, that runs uh, Windows IIS, Windows uh, web server. So this, uh, these type of servers mostly are prone to different attacks. So they will have a lot of issues. And even if you, let's say, if you open a Active Directory into the internet, then definitely you will you are allowing yourself to be hacked. So uh, servers like that are extremely vulnerable to uh, attacks. So if something happens, you can easily find what, what is the port numbers that are being attacked or what are the port numbers that is used. Uh, again, if it's an upload from your server, if, if someone is using your server to do some attack against someone, then you will see it as an upload from your server. Then again, you can see what port numbers they are using. If you find the port number, then you can simply do a, a net, a net stat or uh, HTOP or something and get the port number, uh, the process of the port and then kill the process. So likewise, you can find easily uh, using these kind of applications. So this is, this is the endpoints. And then there are different, so this IO graphs. Number of packets, you can add different things into these IO graphs and then uh, Even with HTTP, HTTP2, I'm not sure there are, yeah, so there were no HTTP2. So if there were HTTP2, you can see. If you go to the analysis part, uh, you can have different uh, filters. You can see the uh, display filters from here. What are the filters that you can use? Some of the examples. And then, uh, 
if you want to uh, do a particular check on a TCP stream, you can simply follow the TCP stream. So it's not just TCP, it can be either a UDP, TLS, HTTP, Quick, anything. So in this case, the TCP stream. So here you can see the TCP stream during that time. So since this is kind of a SSH traffic, you won't see much uh, plain text, but this is uh, packets on the entire communication during that time. Then uh, let's see whether we can find some. Yeah, this is completely HTTP. Yeah, TCP traffic. Uh, if you do this TLS version, you can uh, check the TLS stream as well. Okay, so it doesn't have anything. Um, let's take this one. Yeah, so this is uh, you can see someone is trying to uh, test my uh, testing server. Yeah, so someone in Sri Lanka doing that. Uh, yeah, so likewise, you can identify these things from uh, Vyasha. So I'm not going to go into uh, the exact details of the uh, tutorial. If, if you have any questions while doing those, while identifying those uh, packet captures, just let me know, then I, I will jump into the uh, packet capture. Otherwise, I will let you to do it and identify by it your own. So download this and then So this is the telnet uh, thing. You can uh, check what you can see with this and then identify what is happening.
Uh, so there was a question asking how effective is Wireshark in detecting live intuition attempts. Uh, yeah, so uh, if you are doing it manually, then it, the effectiveness depends on your reactiveness. Actually, uh, it won't do much for detecting intrusion attempts. But if let's say if you if you detect a slowness in your network, if you detect, if you think there's some issue with your network, if you see high traffic to your network, then you can use Wireshark to do the analysis. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, doing a live packet capture, live capture of your traffic, and then uh, analyzing it might not be practical because there will be different types of uh, traffic going here and there, and you might not be able to identify everything as per the network. If you are a complete network person who knows everything, then you might, but still, uh, depending on the speed of the traffic and the number of packets that can that might receive, it is not practical. So detecting live intuition is not a good thing with Wireshark. Wireshark is just for the analysis of whatever the captured packets. So the only purpose why we are using Wireshark is if you want to do a packet capture of some incident, then you need to have a good software to do the analysis. So that is where Wireshark comes. So for live intuition detection, definitely you need to have an IDS implemented uh, or at least use some sort of a network monitoring tool, which provides some uh, intuition detection facility. Things like um, if, you are, if you are not capable of handling an IDS in your institute, then at least try to go with something like uh, NTOPNG. There's a tool called EntopNG. Uh, actually, EntopNG provide free license for educational institutes. Uh, NREN can't get NRENs can't get a license, the free license from EntopNG. Uh, uh, if if you are if and it's EntopNG. So uh, I tried to uh, request EntopNG free license for learn uh, sometimes back and then they replied saying, since we are not an educational institute but an entity that providing services, we are not allowed to have the free license. But as if you are a part of an educational institute, if you are the admin, then you can simply request that, uh, request that and then get a uh, free license. So if you want, then you can simply, you just have to install the NTOP into, uh, into a port mirror uh, soft, uh, server. So a server with a port mirror, a mirror po a mirrored port. And then from the mirror, uh, you can identify different uh, incidents in your network. So NTOP is, NTOP NG is, NTOP and NTOPNG, two things. I'm talking about NTOPNG. Uh, NTOPNG will be a good uh, solution for uh, running uh, network monitoring. Uh, but still, you need to install it in a bare metal device. Don't go with virtual machines. Also, you might need like 8 GB or more, even more than RAM. Uh, if, depending on your network capacity. So if you are, if you are uh, yeah. like, let's say if you want to monitor 100 them, then less than 8 GB would be fine. But if it's more than that, 
try to go with uh, at least 16 GB device because it, it will consume a lot of RAM. Uh, there's a question asking when you use port mirroring, would it not be too noisy? Actually, uh, if you don't use port mirroring, uh, you won't be able to see all the things in your network. So that, uh, again, it's like, if you want to do, then you need to look at everything situation. So if, if you want to check all the, uh, or, or if you want to check the whole network, then you have to do a port mirror from the, uh, from the point where it exits your network or from the point where it enters your network. Uh, but if you want to just to check a single server or just to check a single uh, service, then don't go with port mirroring. Yes, then it will be too noisy. Then just install whatever the service that you want to, uh, that you use to do the monitoring inside that particular server. If you are monitoring a web server, then do the whole, whole monitoring thing within the web server. You can use uh, different monitoring tools. There are a lot of agent-based monitoring tools. You just have to install the agent in that uh, server and then all the other monitoring will be happen in a different place. So, yeah, I think I answered that question. Okay, so uh, while you are doing uh, the lab, I will just quickly go through the other lab as well. So I can uh, explain it to you and then you can do it during the time. So on our web page, there are two other links uh, for email uh, hands-on. So uh, this is not actually securing the email server, but doing some uh, related things to secure the emails, not directly on email, secure, uh, securing the email server itself. Uh, to secure the email server itself, you, you, you need to uh, use uh, IP tables, you need to use fail to ban, and then you need to use TLS for uh, communication. And then you need to block SSH. Uh, if it's not using any web interface, block all the ports. So those are some traditional things you can do. And make sure you always update your email server. Uh, most of uh, most of the time today, we don't use standalone email servers. We try to use email providers, maybe Google, maybe Microsoft. Uh, so because of that, most of the institutes today, we go, we intend to go to the uh, situation because there are a lot of issues with spamming and uh, getting blacklisted and uh, various issues. So. Uh, that's why most of the time people go uh, intends to go to Google or Microsoft. If if you if someone asks whether to go, whether it would be Google or whether it would be Microsoft is the best solution. I'm not going to give you an answer because both of them are commercial providers. They have their own ways of working. 
uh, it depends on what services you use, what type of applications that you are going to use it, uh, uh, Google or Microsoft, whether are you going to use the authentication for different other purposes, things like that, whether you are going to, if someone wants to sync your internal database, let's say if you have thousand users internally, and if you want to uh, sync your username passwords to Google or Microsoft, both both is possible. So Microsoft, Google, both they support uh, this on-prem syncing thing. So it doesn't matter whether you go for Google or Microsoft. Doesn't I don't even yeah because I don't like both. And uh, if you are using a such email service, you are not going to do any server side securing thing except for configuring uh, password strengths or maybe configuring uh, password expiry dates or maybe configuring uh, DNS. So in, in, in this first uh, uh, link, it's an uh, external link from uh, Simbra. So actually we use Simbra uh, as an uh, commercially commercial level uh, email server, email provider. So if, if you want to do a commercial level email installation, go with Simda. They have all the good stuff. Uh, so this is some kind of a guideline by them. And it's uh, I'm giving you the direct link because they will keep this thing updated uh, when there are some changes. So you just have to go to the direct link and then see whether these are actually correct or not. So uh, when securing uh, email uh, servers, when, secu when if uh, securing means you need to uh, have the best practices in sending your emails, especially from the admin side. So these uh, best practices allows you uh, not to get backlisted from the other services. So the main thing behind not getting backlisted is your SPF, DKIM, and DMARC. So today, most of the time, uh, if you are configuring uh, Gmail or if you are configuring Microsoft, they will provide uh, DNS entries related to SPF and DKIM and sometimes DMARC. Uh, but you need to check whether they are acti actively working. So uh, if you are dealing with G Gmail and uh, Microsoft, then that is fine. You already have these entries. You just have to enter them in your DNS provider, in your DNS registry. So if you are the, most of the time, uh, NREN institutes, they maintain their own DNS uh, registries, or at least their research network, they maintain the uh, uh, DNS entry. I'm not sure about uh, your countries, but in case of Sri Lanka, uh, for LEARN, we maintain our own DNS. So our universities, they maintain their own DNS or otherwise learn, maintain their DNS. Uh, in this case, you need to create your SPF and DKIM and DMARC entries if you are hosting a web, uh, if you are hosting a mail server. So uh, this is how you do the SPF or the sender policy framework and what it does. So you can just read and you can create these uh, SPF uh, entry. So for things like these, it's easy to use different DNS wizards from uh, places like uh, MX Toolbox. You can just go to MX Toolbox and create your SPF based on uh, the wizard they have. You just have to, uh, you just have to enter your domain and then uh, see the uh, for example, so 
So there's a domain like this. And if I check the SPF records, So these are the suggestions that it's give, giving, and this is the current record. So I'm using that domain with mailgun.org. So my email email provider is mailgun.org. So the SPF belongs to them, but still you can create an SPF like this. So if you don't have an SPF, so for example, let's say let's put another domain. In this case, here you don't see any SPF current records because it doesn't have any current record. Then you can have the SPF like this. So it will be a text type DNS record with these values. Then, uh, uh, okay, so let's say, So you can see the current record for uh, land.ac.lk domain. So here, this is kind of a long SPF record. It have a lot of IP addresses that are allowed to send email uh, emails with this domain. So what SPF does is it, it basically tells others what are the IP addresses that this a particular domain contains. So if you send an email uh, with the same email, with the email domain of learn.ac.lk apart from any of these IP addresses, then the recipients will deny your email saying that email, that email server is not listed under the SPF. So whatever the email servers we use for this domain, this particular domain should be included within this mentioned addresses. So you can see there are like slash 27 and then again another slash 27. Here there's a 26, then uh, IPv6 range. So actually sla two slash 64s. So actually we are using multiple <coughs> subnets because we use the same domain for different uh, servers with, with different servers which are on these different subnets. That's why it's, uh, it is there. So you can <clears throat> include these things in this wizard and then uh, they will include all the stuff uh, in your SPF record then you can just copy paste, copy these things into a text record uh, in your DNS server. Uh, so that is the SPF. Uh, you can read why we need this and what they are. And then DKIM. So DKIM means uh, we use uh, public key cryptography or private public key pairs to verify your authentic, verify you, who is the person who's sending. So uh, domain key identified mails is a method to associate domain names and the email, allowing to a person or company, assuming the responsibility of the email. So that is the main purpose of that. So even to create these things, you can simply uh, use some of these commands given in the example if you are not already using DKIM. So these are some of the commands related to Simbra installations, but still you can associate it with your own installation. So it's basically giving the uh, uh, public key on, on a DNS So how to do it, how to do that is given here. You just have to uh, create the public keys, private keys, and then include it in your DKIM. And then uh, the DMARC. So the DMARC stands for Domain-Based Message Authentication Reporting and Confirmation. 
so uh, sometimes there will be different applications specifically asking for DMARC entries. If you set up the DMARC entry, then uh, you can simply receive whatever the uh, errors that uh, get in your network. So there are different DMARC uh, assistants. You just, you can use this DMARC. Uh, and then they, they will ask whether there are different policies, whether to reject emails, whether to quarantine or whether to do nothing. So it depends on your, uh, on your policies, uh, how to test it. So here you can see the testing. So for example, let's do this. Anyway, I'm not administrating learn.ac.lk in here, so I'm not responsible on what you see here. So uh, here, this is <laughs> this is the uh, DMARC record that we have for learn. So it gives you a warning saying uh, record tag P set to none. That means we are not receiving any uh, policy up, uh, uh, we are not applying any policies for the uh, failed checks. So failed checks can be done with none, quarantine or reject. If that means if the DMARC fails, you are rejecting the mail. So then uh, there are some uh, responses where you get the uh, you need to mention the email addresses so that if there's someone complaining, then they will send the email, send a notification to that particular email. Likewise, so this is the current DMARC entry. And if I go with my uh, domain, I think I haven't, I can't remember actually. Oh. Yeah, there's no DMARC record. So since this is maintained by uh, mailgun.org, uh, I'm not going to create DMARC because it's maintained by them. It's the mail service maintained by them, not me. Uh, so you can simply use these kind of tools to do the testing, but uh, again, it's just based on whether you need to go into more details of the security of emails. But if you have these kind of details, then it will be good for your email server. Uh, and it will be a good thing to be in the whitelisted site of the emails. And then the reverse DNS. Uh, so most of the time, again, you need to do the re reverse DNS if you want your emails to be accepted by most of the email, other email servers. If let's say, if you, if you set up an email server today, and if you try to send an email to Gmail, most probably Gmail will block you. Gmail will reject your email saying your, uh, your server is not authenticated or it's not right or something like that. So for that, you need to set up the SPF. You need to set up uh, uh, DKIM most of the time and then uh, definitely the reverse DNS. So make sure they are configured in your system. Okay, I'm running through the whole thing now. Uh, then I'll go quickly go to the PGP part. Again, this is how you set up PGP on Windows, so these screenshots belongs to Windows XP or Windows 7, because uh, they, they are some old screenshots, but since we are not uh, using, in learn, we are not using Windows, so most of the time, so we don't have good uh, relationship with Windows. Anyhow, uh, to use PGP uh, with uh, anything, you need to have something called GNUPG. Mm. So it doesn't matter whether it's Windows or whether it's Linux, you can use GNUPG with 
many uh, operating systems you can simply download this uh, into your whatever the operating system you can see uh, these things and uh, it will give you all the uh, additional software that you need to uh, do this pgp communication and so these are for windows but uh, i'm not going to go into details of these there's another uh, uh, the basic thing here is you need to install this software and then you need to create a key if you are not using pgp already if you use pgp you can simply import your private key here and then it will automatically detect and then uh, once you create a pgp when when you're creating a pgp it will ask whether to create a pgp or whether to create a smime if you create smime you need to send it to a ca and get it certified otherwise it won't be useful for you but if you use pgp you can simply uh, upload that pgp public key make sure you upload the public key not the private key you can upload your private uh, public key into the uh, key stores and then it will be uh, public and it will be working so uh, when creating uh, key, uh, keys it will ask for your email and your working name so make sure you enter your email correctly as well as your name as per your email client if you are use from let's say for me i'm using Kilina patron as my email display name then don't use something else as your name in this uh, point because uh, when someone is comparing your name and email they will look for your name on your email header not not the one uh, we are mentioned here so make sure those things are correctly mentioned and then you can decide the bit uh, bit types most of the time we will go with rsa and uh, some bit uh, value uh, larger than uh, 2048 so uh, currently uh, most of the application they go for uh, 3000 something 3078 72 but it depends but don't go for 1024 because 1024 is breakable at the moment so go for something more than 3000 and then you can use this for signing and encryption both again if you want for authentication you can use it for authentication but most of the time people don't use authentication again you can de define a expiry date uh, for this so uh, it depends on how you going to use this key if if it is for email if if you are on a, a permanent situation at your job if you are going to use that email address email identity for a longer period then use this uh, uh, expiry date at least 10 years ahead or you can simply uh, remove this tick then it will be valid forever so for me i'm using a key that is valid forever i'm not expired i'm not mentioning an expired date once this once the key is created it will give you the uh, public key and the private key pairs you can send you can download these uh, keys into your machine and go to a open pgp key server and then upload your uh, public key into that server it's free you just have to copy paste that and then it will automatically upload that's how it works okay so this is some uh, other details and i want to mention something about uh, envelope dot uh, mail and mail blog dot com which is a open source uh, actually it's a free service for you uh, so if you go to this Uh, you can download their extension for 
whatever the browser you are using, whether it's Chrome or uh, Firefox or Edge, I'm not using Edge much, but these two will be used. Uh, once you install this, it will uh, install some uh, plugin like this. You can see there's a small plugin on my Firefox. So this plugin comes with something like this. And if I go to the dashboard, uh, it will give you the key management on browser. So you don't have to install uh, a different software. You can simply use your browser to do the key management, even creating keys. So if I go to key management here, you can see there's, a, there's already a key for me. So that key was created in 2015. Uh, if I go inside that, there are a few other identities for the same key. I'm using Tilinat Learn, Tilinat something, Tilinat something, likewise. So there are a lot of email addresses, including my private uh email so these are some of the uh things you can do with your key you can associate all your email addresses into the same key so that uh everyone knows who you are so there are so these two uh emails belongs to a single person so everyone knows this is a single person uh, then you can give a password for the private key. You can uh, make it expire. So here, this is a uh, uh, two, uh, 2048 length key. Uh, likewise, then again, you can create a new key. You can generate a new key for your email as well. You can uh, put an email, you can select the RSS So now, for this, it's giving uh, 4096 as the default bit value. You can give a password for the key. You can generate uh, for the mail, mail when lock uh, thing. And then you can use the same thing for encrypting content and decrypting content. Uh, the other uh, good thing with this uh with this uh plugin is once you go into uh gmail or uh, let's say okay so this is my gmail account one of the gmail accounts that is being authorized to use you can see there's a small uh m symbol which means we can use uh, PGP for the emails. And uh, if I go back uh, in the options, you can associate different uh, and Gmail accounts here. You can see I'm using this Gmail account uh, for the authorization. So in this case, uh, you can see two, uh, okay, it's already uh, uh, changed. So uh, I'll just show you a sample email from the uh, uh, PGP encrypted mail. So this is a PGP encrypted mail. So this is an encrypted mail. If, if I want to read the mail, uh, I need to click here and then it will ask for the password, but if if we look at the uh, original mail, so this is the uh, original mail. Uh, okay, that is again not showing me the mail. <laughs> You can download this and read it in text mode.
yeah so this is uh, the mail header and once you go into the message part this is the message so it's encrypted but if i uh, click here then it will ask for my password and once i click you will see the message so this is the message uh, but that is encrypted mail but if 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 you want to send an email uh, for example uh, let's send an email so i'm going to send an email signed uh, for my uh, okay let's send it to my uh, gmail you can select if there are multiple uh, certificates that you can select which certificate you are going to use so i'm going to use my certificate and then click sign only and it will the message will be sent so if i go to send messages you can see a message uh, to tilina with the yeah it's it's not showing you the clear text message because it's uh, because of the plugin. Otherwise, you can see there's something in the PGP sign message. So if I go to my uh, here, you will see the message, and here you can see open PGP on Thunderbird saying. Uh, yeah, uncertain digital signature. Why? Okay, so so my client is identifying this for the first time. So because of that, it's not identify. It's not seeing the P open PGP. Uh, Mail, but if I again check the uh, source, you can see now this is the message test mail, it's in plain text, but you can see there's a, another part, additional part as the signature. Uh, even with Thunderbird, if you are a Thunderbird fan, then uh, on Thunderbird, there's uh, uh, not on reference, on, uh, on account settings, there's something called end-to-end -end encryption, where you can upload your same key here. You can export it from the mail uh, envelope or from the GPU, uh, GPG, uh, GNU GPG, and then include it here. So this is my same key. Uh, then it will uh, do the rest for you. So you don't have to install any other application. So it can be either a, a open PGP certificate or an SMIME certificate. So here in this case, I'm using uh, the PGP certificate. And then once you have different users, you will, once you uh, trust different users you will see your trusted parties in this key manager so in this case i'm i have so this is my temporary uh, device so i'm not trusting anyone because of that i don't have much uh, uh, trusted parties i'm trying to find some uh, Okay, I don't think I can find any. 
Yeah. Anyway, um, so that is about open PGP. Any questions? I rushed a lot. I hope most of you got what I was trying to tell about. Uh, Any questions? Okay, there was a missed question from Pema about SIEMs. Uh, yeah, so if, if you are uh, using an SIEM solution, uh, use that because it will uh, it will keep track on whatever the incidents that you have faced. So I'm not going to mention any uh, good solution because most of them depends on how they work. So if you have any uh, familiar version, familiar product, then go with it. Uh, but don't trust. 100% on any of these tools. So that's the basic thing. Okay, any questions? Any other questions? If not, I will stop for today. Uh, so I passed 10 minutes. Uh, I hope you didn't mind that. Uh, so next week uh, on Monday and Tuesday, we'll be doing the last two sessions of the workshop. And uh, that uh, at that time, we'll be discussing on uh, some monitoring and performance stuff, especially with uh, NetFlows and P uh, Persona. So if if you are familiar with these things, then it will be much more easy for me, and especially with uh, things like Persona. I will send you uh, links if we need to download anything that uh, uh, the thing like what we did for Kali. If, if, if we need to download something uh, large, then I will send you the links. Uh, I was thinking whether to go for Persona installation, but let's see what we can do. Uh, so uh, the other thing, next Monday, uh, we should take some group photos for 10 reporting. Uh, so I would like to request everyone to switch on their cameras on Monday. So prepare yourself, dress nice. I'm just telling something, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so Monday we will do that as well. And uh, yeah, so go with the tutorial, go with the uh, penetration testing, install Kali and uh, install OpenVAS on the machine and try to find different things in your network. Uh, don't don't do any penetration testing on live device live systems without notif uh, notifying everyone else. Uh, so that is the summary. And uh, if you have any questions, you can always write to me. You know my email. Uh, there's another message. If you could let us know what is required for down. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I will send you the links for the things that you need to download, uh, maybe end of today or by tomorrow. So uh, yeah, so that will be the last thing for today. If you don't have any questions, we can drop the meeting. Okay, then see you everyone, happy weekend and stay safe.